When Taxi Driver came by, I realized I had to choose between whether I was going to make Hollywood-type pictures or uh, more personal movies. And that's what I felt that I should do it, because I had to keep on trying to make as many personal pictures as possible within the system, within the Hollywood system. Because it doesn't matter where you live in America, if you make a film in New York or Chicago or whatever, it's still a Hollywood film. I felt that's the kind of film I should be making, because it had an honesty to it and a truthfulness about it. De Niro, myself, and sort of Chapman, you know, we felt very strongly about the emotions that the story created in us. It made us very passionate about making the film and making the best film we could make under the circumstances. And then, of course, defending it in the editing, that became a big issue. Interesting to note, I think, that it was a film that we didn't think was going to be seen by anybody. We just had to make it. We didn't think it was going to be successful uh, financially, and it was. And we didn't think it was going to be recognized uh, critically, and it was. Personal filmmaking always considers the audience, because you are the audience. You really are. Who are you telling the story to? You're going to be telling your story to somebody who want to listen, we hope who want to watch, who want to experience, I should say. Personal filmmaking, and the best kind, I think, opens a line of communication with people in the audience that you don't expect. In the case of Taxi Driver, it was from people in America to people in Mongolia. I was in China in 1984. A young man was asking me questions. He came from Mongolia. He was asking me questions repeatedly about Taxi Driver, ultimately ending in the question, what do you do about the loneliness? And this is a picture that I hadn't expected for people to, to identify with, but it touched a nerve, and that's what Schrader wrote you know, in terms of the character, Travis Bickle, and the way De Niro acted it, in which uh, Schrader was able to create the character, the feelings, the thoughts, and the psychological insight, uh, this character of Travis, Travis Bickle. And I just identified with him. He's an outsider, a loner, a loser to a certain extent. There was something that touched a chord in me that I felt I could express that through the visual interpretation of, of, of the film. I mean, we just felt, geez, we you know, really feel bad and uh, we're really upset. And, this is how we feel about life and things. And it was really part, maybe part of it was a, a coming of age process for all of us, Schrader, myself, De Niro. Maybe that's a similar thing for younger people watching the film who are affected by it. Maybe it's part of a coming of age process. Occasionally in, uh, in art, you get lucky and you're at the right place at the right time with the right people. And I think that was the case with Taxi Driver. And I think that uh, Marty's highly frenetic, cutting against the grain, urbanized style was a wonderful counterpoint to the sort of Protestant reserve and inhibition of the character in the screenplay. A New Yorker, so I see everything that way. The whole idea of being in a car, and Bob had, he could tell you, he, he actually drove a cab a couple of nights. It was an interesting experience. I must have done it a week or 10 days, give or take. He told me that uh, one of the first feeling he had after a couple of nights was that, and he did it at night, was that um, a person will get in a car, stranger, and then control your life, in effect, for the next 20 minutes or 45 minutes. You go where I want you to go. Yeah, exactly. It does something to a person who works at night, especially driving in the streets and not knowing who's gonna get into your car. It's very dangerous, and he's living on the edge, you know. So naturally, things begin to take on a different meaning to him, especially at 4.30 in the morning. But he puts himself right in the war zone, and he's upset by it. And the more he's upset by it, the more he stays in it. If you look at the first scene, he says, where will you go, will you go up to Harlem? Will you go here? Will you go there? He says, I'll go anywhere, commenting on the idea of, literally, this idea of a person who's repulsed by this sort of thing so much, and yet surrounds himself with it, so that he could torture himself with it, I think, and then eventually act out on it, against it. And really, he's acting out on those things inside himself. He's certainly not cured by the end of the picture, that's for sure. That's why I always, I always try that thing at the end, the little flip of the mirror to show that he, uh, he, it's just the time bomb ticking away again. That is the human condition, and it's tragic. And, and it's, it's set up in such a way that will, it will do us in as a species if we don't learn about it. I don't put it up there for people to enjoy it, you know? And if they are enjoying it, they catch themselves enjoying it, and the characters pay for it. You talking to me? Literally, I'm sitting at his feet. There's a mirror behind me in the camera, and there's a window, and that's it. And it was, again, the last week of shooting, and we went an hour and a half too long, and our AD was banging on the door. Let it, come on, we've got to go. I said, I know, but I think this is really good. Just give us another five minutes. All right, all right, but they're going to kill us. Like, okay. So, I mean, it was always under that incredible pressure. He said, gonna, he said uh, you're talking to me, and uh, we started doing the business with the gun, which is it, with scripted. He's doing that with his face. And he suddenly got into a rhythm, particularly, are you talking to me? What we often do is we just have the actor repeat it, repeat it. So you create the atmosphere, and you make it as easy as possible for them to take their time if they're onto something. Take the time, even if you have to get out of there in 15 minutes. Part of that energy is the panic of getting out of there. And he's just going to take his time, and he's going to raise that gun, and he's going to say, I saw you coming. 
you know. And I really knew he had something when he said, uh, I, I know you're talking to me because I'm the only one here. And I said, well, in, in effect, in the film, he is the only one. He's realized he's the only one there. And ultimately, I realized that visually, we should pretty much see everything from Travis's point of view, not that anybody else's thought process or frame of mind really enter into the film. And this would isolate him more and put you more on his side, so to speak. Meaning that it just seemed to me, no matter what the character is, that you're sort of, you're going along the journey with that character. You may like the character, you may not. I always tried to shoot Bob in a single frame on his shot. Uh, however, when you take other people, we try to shoot past him and include him in their frames. Uh, so that we always try to kind of psychologically that way, separate from everybody else. I thought that maybe that would, that would give the impression of him, his separateness from other people. He's floating through a sea and he's kind of floating through the city. And he's got a jacket on, a tie, and it has an element where he's almost freeing himself, you know, floating through the city. But on the other hand, because of the speed of the film, there's always that element of anxiety or tension. It's like a person moving slowly before he attacks. We tried to not keep the cutting of the film in straight narrative. Uh, after, after he gets out of the cab up earlier, takes the rag in his hand, then it jump cuts and he's cleaning up the back seat. And that was the idea, to try to keep disorienting the uh, sense of un anxiety and uneasiness that we wanted to give the audience. The main action is here, uh, him on the phone. Now. It was so uncomfortable for him, this conversation. Well, uh, so painful. Holding it on him. And he's just getting refused and re rejected and rejected oh, okay. and rejected. Okay. And the camera starts to move as if it's about to reveal something. When I thought of that shot, it gave, it, it, it presented to me the idea is that there's a sense, again, of anxiety, a sense of uh, uneasiness of uh, the camera tracking to an empty hall. Are we about to reveal something that's, uh, is there about to be an explosion? Is something terrible gonna happen in the hall? You know, uh, it was the idea of keeping the audience off balance all the time. All the other shots came from that concept that's, that's in that shot right now. Envisioning all the, all the, all the shots, I would draw the, the shots on the side of the script and break it down into setups and angles and moves. And then I would take those notes and transfer them to actual drawings in storyboards so that the entire crew could see every day the amount of shots we were getting, the type of shots we were gonna get. Because when other people did it, it looked like a, it looked like a, a comic strip, which was good. But when I did it, it was a matter of the actual, the arrows pointing for camera movements and things like that that you had. And that was what he needed to see. He needed to see, and it was very simple. You'd take these, these shots, and we get as many as possible for the day. And then, if we have two left, they were literally these two left in our hand here, on our right hand. We got to get them. We got to pick them up. Got to get them later. So you know, and you, after a while, you had a stack of shots that you that you were you were behind. You know, and it was a very simple thing. It was it was. Um, I just spent lots of time drawing the pictures and drawing the pictures, uh, in the hotel suite I had at the at the St. Regis Hotel. I've always felt that. Uh, It'd be wonderful if I could shoot a film the way I see things, literally the way I see things as I'm walking around. And I happen to move very quickly. I walk fast and I talk fast, and, and I see things quickly, I think. And I've tried to formulate it into a style. It is literally like taking the eye, uh, the heads of the, uh, the people in the audience and grabbing them by the back of their hair and forcing them to see things by different cuts and camera moves the way I see them, or the way I get impressions that I see them. They're really impressions of what I see and movement. I'm really annoyed that I can never really get certain camera moves fast enough. You point the audience's eye to look where you want them to look and to get the point, the emotional, psychological point that you want to get across to them. They're gonna have to make that decision. The real making of the filmmakers when they look to that viewfinder. Make your own industry. Recreate movies. Don't pay attention to the industry. Do your own thing. Get new art. Take what's available, push it, you know because it's gonna go there, you could do anything.